This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, hi there. Welcome aboard the train we like to call the Ag Express. He is Kenny. I am Ray, and as always, our promise to you, the latest and greatest in Georgia agriculture. That is right. Coming up for over a decade, he was held in high regard as a member of the House Ag Committee here in Georgia. So much so, he's now the chair of the committee. A conversation with Robert Dickey, including his agenda moving forward. Despite the pandemic, the Georgia Cotton Commission's annual meeting went off as planned. Why producers felt the need to discuss an old pest, the boll weevil. And then later, so much for hay, feed, and other farm foods. The animals on this farm, well, they get the good stuff. All handmade by the Oglethorpe County 4-H Club. The unique story of how these four-legged creatures actually benefited from the pandemic. All this and more, starting right now on the Farm Monitor. With agriculture representing Georgia's number one industry, the chairman of its committee holds a crucial role in state government. In the House, that would be the newly appointed Robert Dickey of Peach County, who knows good and well he's got some pretty big shoes to fill. Damon Jones has that story. With a farm gate value approaching $14 billion annually, agriculture is vital to the future of Georgia's economy. And for the past 16 years, legislative decisions on the House side ran through the committee chair, Tom McCall. However, with McCall now retired from the Georgia General Assembly and currently serving as Georgia Farm Bureau president, that role now falls on Congressman Robert Dickey, who feels privileged by the opportunity. I'm very honored to be named this position. It is big shoes to fill uh, following uh, Tom McCall. He did such a great job uh, leading the House side of the committee up here for so many years. And uh, so I kind of pitched myself walking in here and sitting behind this desk, it's big, uh, big responsibility. And uh, it's kind of hit home this week uh, when I took this over. It's a responsibility he takes very seriously, considering he has spent his entire life around the industry. I just grew up in our little rural uh, Musala, my, uh, our peach farm was multi-generation. Uh, my great grandfather and, and father and just love working there. My son's there now uh, with, with us. and. And uh, my, my roots go way back in agriculture uh, in Crawford County, right outside Macon. And uh, with a lot of timberland, a lot of peaches, and there we are strong into agritourism. So uh, I love agriculture. It's been great to my family. That's why Dickey requested to be on the Ag Committee as soon as he took office nearly 11 years ago. And during that time, major progress was made on issues ranging from taxes to water. And now that he chairs the committee, it's his responsibility to preserve those gains while also tackling future issues. I'm trying to hold uh, hold the, the great strides we've made before. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look for a uh, right to farm bill, uh, a lot of tax issues that we want to make sure that we uh, hold on to. It's always a lot of environmental and budget. We've got to help make sure that uh, our ag education and uh, uh, and research is strong. Even though he is less than a week on the job, his main focus is very clear. My goal is to, is to keep the environment uh, in Georgia strong for agriculture, whether it's uh, production, whether it's agribusiness, whether it's uh, tourism, or just it's a great um, asset to our state, the employment and, and, um, and the lives that, that agriculture in rural Georgia uh, provide our state and I just want to keep it uh, keep it strong. And that means the entire state as he recognizes the difficulties facing the rural population. During this COVID period this past year I think people have uh, come to realize that uh, their food supply is, is very very important and where it comes from and how they get it and the safety of it. But uh, our rural areas have, have really suffered uh, during the years and, at times. And uh, so I want to kind of pick those, that up and, and uh, make sure our, ru our rural areas are blessed and growing as our, as our other metro areas. Reporting from Fulton County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. In the meantime, with Georgia being one of the country's leading cotton producers and the crop itself contributing a substantial amount of money towards the state's economy, Maintaining those numbers or even improving on them is one of the goals of the Georgia Cotton Commission. But like so many other organizations, maneuvering through obstacles of a pandemic resulted in the GCC having to make some minor adjustments. John Holcomb has the story. 
Every year in January, this is the scene down in Tifton as cotton producers from all over the state gather together for the Georgia Cotton Commission's annual meeting. However, that was not the case this year as the commission made the decision to hold the meeting virtually due to COVID-19. The way they felt they could keep their growers safe and still get important information out to them. The Georgia Cotton Commission's annual meeting, we've been doing it for approximately 15 years um, and it's just a an event to gather the, the cotton industry as a whole uh, here in the state and to update growers and other interested people on, on what's going on in the cotton industry. So much of what affects our producers is things that goes on beyond, beyond the farm. Um, so updates on, on regulatory issues or, or uh, updates from Washington, updates from the Extension Service, things like that are very important to the success of our farmers. That's especially true after a year like 2020, in which cotton took a big hit as market prices plummeted due to the pandemic. We started out the year with probably the best start that we'd ever had, um, and the pandemic hit, and cotton, probably more so than most commodities, took a, a pretty astronomical hit from the pandemic from a, from a market perspective. Futures got as low as you know, down below 50 cent, and, and that's you know, obviously problematic for, for, our, for our producers. Coming off a year like 2020 is one reason why the commission thought it was important to have a discussion on a very detrimental pest that, in the past, was 25% of producers' production cost, and that was the boll weevil. When we had boll weevils in the state of Georgia, it wasn't uncommon for individual growers to spray a field of cotton upwards of 20 times in a season. You know, that's a big change to where we are today. Um, but the first boll weevil was found in the state of Georgia in 1915. And believe it or not, at that time, there were over 5 million acres of cotton in Georgia. Uh, the boll weevil basically devastated the cotton industry, and we saw a reduction in acres down to not much over 100,000 acres uh, in the mid-80s. Thankfully, here in Georgia, the boll weevil was eradicated back in the 80s and was last seen almost 20 years ago. But the important thing they want producers to know is that just because it was eradicated doesn't mean it can't come back, which could be devastating to Georgia's cotton industry if it did. We have not found a boll weevil in Georgia since 2002. Would it be a threat here if it, if it were to be introduced? I can tell you this, that in the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas where they're trying to actively uh, eradicate the boll weevil, they produce a maximum of about 200,000 acres of cotton a year. That, that program sprayed 1.297 million acres last year trying to control the boll weevil. Yes, if the boll weevil came here, it would have a very detrimental effect on our production. Reporting in Tift County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, John, thanks so much. Meantime, the National Cotton Council reporting that researchers are trying to figure out what led to a significant increase in seed coat fragments during the 2020 cotton season. Of the 2.2 million samples that were classed, approximately 895,000 of those contained fragments, while a portion of the samples also contained whole cotton seed. To break it all down, here's Daryl Ernest, Deputy Administrator for USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service Cotton and Tobacco Program. This year in the southeast, predominantly the southern half of Alabama, the northern part of Florida, and all of Georgia, we've seen a historic increase in the number of samples received, which represents all the bales in that territory, containing seed coat fragments, which is a form of extraneous matter that we classify in our visual determination part of our classing process. And it started really from the beginning of the season. As soon as we started receiving cotton, we noticed that we were seeing more sea coat fragments than we would normally see in a season. We see sea coat fragments every year to some extent in almost every location uh, across the country that we have offices, but uh, usually to a, a relatively small degree. It's an unfortunate situation with any time you have a quality issue like this come up. There's nothing about our operation that has changed. It's been a very challenging season for us to get through as it has been for our stakeholders and we certainly we feel for them and we know that 
Seco fragments carry a discount, and we know that's not something that they want in their cotton, but we also know that our role is to, to be that, that unbiased third party that basically looks at the cotton that's in front of us and we grade it accordingly. I commend our staff for doing a, a good job this year. We've got a series of checks and balances in place and supervisory checks that we do every single day throughout every single shift to make sure that not only our instruments run consistently and accurately, but our human graders do as well. So I've been satisfied with all of the data that I've seen throughout the whole season that we've done it correctly and accurately amidst the fact that we know it's been a very challenging season. After the break, they were cooking to share with families in need. That was until the pandemic came along. Now Oglethorpe County 4-Hers are cooking for their four-legged friends in need. That's next when the Farm Monitor continues. Horticulture professor Esther Vandernap is a plant geneticist and molecular biologist who joined the University of Georgia Department of Horticulture and the Center for Applied Genetic Technologies in 2015. She has spent much of her career working to understand the genetic shifts that have occurred between ancestral wild tomato varieties and modern cultivated tomatoes. She has helped to pinpoint a gene that regulates the size of the tomato's individual cells which in turn helps to regulate the size of the overall fruit. Funded by the National Science Foundation, Vandernap and her team have contributed important knowledge about the history of tomato by analyzing the genomes of multiple ancestral tomato varieties. This information is providing valuable insight into how the tomato crop has evolved over the millennia and has implications for the evolution of other plants. Vandernap has garnered more than $12 million in research funding at UGA, in addition to teaching and mentoring graduate and undergraduate students. In 2014, she was named a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. When COVID-19 derailed their mission of feeding families in need, the Oglethorpe 4-H Club could have called it a day, pumped the brakes on their Cooking to Share initiative, but they didn't. Instead, they redirected their attention towards animals in need, at least for the time being. Or is it temporary? If the director of Sweet Olive Farm in Winneville has it her way, this newly discovered partnership and friendship will last forever. For one to truly appreciate this story, it's important to step back in time. 2010 to be exact. That's when Kat Halkins first began her incredible journey of taking care of animals. We uh, were rescuing dogs in Atlanta and uh, had gotten a ticket for having too many dogs, so we had to get a kennel license. And when the animal control officer, Melissa, from uh, Fulton County Animal Control said, uh, Hey, I know it'll really make your neighbors mad. We have a pot-bellied pig we're about to euthanize. And I said, well, we just rented a farmhouse to take the dogs to. So I was a landscaper and went and I picked up the uh, pig while the guys were up here building the pen. And then we were on speed dial for a lot of farm and exotic animals from then on. And there you have it. The humble beginnings of what would become Sweet Olive Farm and Animal Rescue. From those first couple of dogs to the pot belly pig named Mr. Thelma, Kat and co-founder Susan Pritchett are now the providers and caretakers of nearly 250 four-legged creatures and birds. So when Kat received the call from 4-H wanting to provide delicious and nutritious treats for the animals, she jumped at the offer. In fact, Kat feels it may have been a sign from a higher place. I call it a blessing. Um... I, they and the, the care and the time they take to make their cookies, their doggy cookies, animal cookies. I mean, and the kids are so caring and generous. I mean, it's just really, uh, it just gives you a great feeling about just humanity and how these young people are just, are so giving of their time and their energy and, and markets too. 
Well, we were feeding uh, families in need in Oglethorpe County. And then when COVID hit, COVID-19 hit, uh, some UGA policies came down and uh, we were not allowed to feed anybody, the, the youth, the 4-Hers that came to the office or feed families with our, with our uh, cooking club. So it was either uh, we had to pivot and switch gears or we couldn't have cook and share anymore. And so every couple of weeks, the 4-Hers break out the cooking gear, roll up their sleeves and get to work. Their generous treats, tasty for even human consumption. Things like peanut butter bars, sweet potato fries, and apple cinnamon cupcakes, all of which are made using animal safe recipes the students find online. But this program and the service these kids provide runs deeper than just the food they prepare or the animals they feed. Not only are the kids gaining confidence in the kitchen, they're also developing life skills as well as positive relationships and community awareness. I don't think they really saw the end result with the, the regular cooking shares we had at feeding the, feeding the families because they just didn't see the end result. They didn't see the, the fruits of their labor. You work hard, you, you cook a meal, and then they can see it, it does result and benefit the, the, uh, the animals. Kind of be like, oh, this is meaningful. And um, because all of our animals have a story, they all are rescued, we provide them a forever home. A lot of these kids may come from a farm that does, you know, that it's a straight up farm, um, but they don't make, they are very respectful of these animals and they, uh, I, but I think it makes them happy that they're really giving back and, um, and that if they are city, or most of the kids around here aren't super city kids, but they are you know, more urban than they have been in the past, but I think it makes it kind of cool to be country again. And even cooler than being country, the animals' reaction when they see the kids coming. Oh, uh, they're gonna head right toward that gate. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're, they're gonna go. And what I do is walk around and I'm like, y'all, we like run or y'all don't, don't carry those into the middle of all those animals. We love 4-H and we, uh, we love those, the kids, the, the fact that they're just, it's just a, a great relationship and it's just so mutually beneficial for the animals, for us and, uh, and for the uh, high schoolers. Yeah, that was a fun time. A lot of unique animals out there. All right, time for our final break. Up next, planting for the future and doing so using longleaf pines. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Mark McClellan, Stewardship Coordinator with the Georgia Forestry Commission, and welcome to another episode of our virtual field day series. In today's episode, we're going to discuss longleaf pine establishment. Longleaf pines have become a cultural icon here in the South. Landowners plant longleaf due to their hardiness, their timber potential, and their ecosystem services. Longleaf pine have become a major conservation priority. To tell us more about Longleaf Pine Establishment, we have invited Amanda Hambrick, one of our foresters from Region 5, to discuss site prep, proper planting techniques, and maintenance of Longleaf Pine. Like Mark said, we are here today to discuss proper practices for Longleaf Establishment. There are a few things I want to mention first. Longleaf does very well on numerous soil types, but only on soils that are well drained as they do not tolerate frequent flooding. Another thing to remember is you need to be able to control your woody and herbaceous vegetation as longleaf does not compete well with other plants. Any competition for water, sunlight, or nutrients will affect the seedling's survival chance and stunt its initial growth. Now, let's take a walk and go look at a site that's prepared to be planted. As you can see, this site has already been prepped. 
Site prep usually involves any combination of herbicide, mechanical, or prescribed burning. This site in particular only used herbicide and prescribed burning. The herbicide used should be based on the vegetation present and the timing of the application. Following this application with a prescribed burn will help clear the dead vegetation and facilitate easier planting. Now back to Mark for more about seed quality. Before making this type of investment, it is important to plant quality seedlings. So first things first, choose a reputable grower. I even recommend making a site visit to the nursery. Try to establish a relationship with the grower and discuss your plan to establish the stand. So let's talk about ordering. It is important to know your land management goals and the number of acres you intend to plant before you order your seedlings. This will help indicate the number of seedlings you plant per acre. And I always recommend to order no more seedlings than you can plant in four to five days out. Transportation is another thing to consider. I recommend transporting long leaves in a closed trailer. If you don't have access to a closed trailer, make sure you cover it with a tarp. Wind can quickly dry out these seedlings. Proper storage is another important concept to consider as well. Some of the worst mistakes landowners can make is letting the trees dry out before planting. Keep the seedlings in the original container, store in a cool, dry place, and make sure they are out of direct sunlight and avoid any wind exposure. At the planting site, be sure to inspect all seedlings. I recommend culling or throwing out any trees that are poor quality. Each plug should have a quarter inch single stem root collar. Each should have a healthy dark green six to 10 inch needles. No obvious signs of pest. Adequate moisture in the plugs, not too dry, not saturated. No signs of mildew or rot. Firm root ball, a visible white tip roots, and no excessive girdling roots. Now back to Amanda to discuss planting techniques. Proper planting depth is crucial. When planting, do not plant too deep or too shallow. The proper planting depth will be where the bud is slightly above the ground and never buried. A recommended position for the bud is approximately two inches above the soil surface, leaving one and a half inches of the plug exposed above the soil surface. Good compaction is also crucial as this eliminates any air pockets around the seedling roots. Although seed quality has improved in recent years, the survivability depends largely on proper site prep and planting. A high quality planting job will help to ensure that what you plant today will be a stand that you manage tomorrow. Thanks again, Amanda, for showing us more about establishing a longleaf pine stand. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or other stewardship topics, please visit our website, gatrees.org. That's all we have today. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. All right, thanks so much to the Georgia Forestry Commission and thank you for making this show possible. Before we send you on your way, a friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia farms, be sure you check out all of our social media platforms. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of agriculture and with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week, everybody.